Hi, Terry. It makes a change for me to be talking to you instead of you talking to someone else with me. Yep. So, um, and this is all about your book that's uh, being launched this Saturday, yes. Tales from the Green Hills. Um, so tell us uh, a little bit about this book, uh, Tales of the Green Hills. It's not the first time it's been around, but we'll come back to that later. Okay. This is a, like a relaunch, isn't it? It is. But um, you, will you tell us a bit of history behind it all? Okay. What, what the book's about, first and foremost. Okay, the sort of plot lies... Um... Well, a boring, a boring description would be for a sociologist looking at the story, the adventure. He'd say the story's about an inner city teenager, Tommy Dwyer, who is initially dysfunctional, yet over the course of the adventure, he becomes functional. Uh, probably Sounds a precise, boring. it's a boring description. <laughs> a more interesting <laughs> breakdown would be a, a Liverpool teenager during the heatwave summer of 1976, whose girlfriend has just dumped him decide to do whatever the hell he likes over a two-week period before he ends up in a casualty ward in hospital. Sounds interesting. <laughs> Better than the, uh, the sociologist view. Oh, most definitely, yeah. yeah. So, um, Green Hills, tales yeah. from the Green Hills. Green Hills, where are they? I, I just assumed Green Hills were hills in Wales, but yeah. they're clearly not. Or is it fictitious? I don't think it is, is it? I've, I use real places but real street names in and around the Childwell area. Well, I've got to say of the time, but still are now. The location right. in the book, it's an area that joins Bentham Drive to Chelwood Avenue, cutting across a disused railway line and includes what used to be Chilwell Hall School for Girls. And Plus, as the novel's set in three parts, the Green Hills area in Chilwell, the second part involves a holiday stay at a farm in North Wales, an area of green and, well, green hills. <laughs> so Green and pleasant sort of, land. Yeah. Green and pleasant land, yeah. And Tommy's feet did green walk hills, upon yeah. those. La- <laughs> yeah, Jerusalem almost, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a subtitle, Two Weeks in the Summer of 76. Now, is this the setting and the time period? I'm assuming it is in that glorious summer we had, if I remember rightly. It was indeed, yeah. Yeah, I remember the year, the spectacular heat wave. I was 17 at the time, and the summer just seems like, Carry on forever. Went on till I October. Yeah, I remember it very well. I was in the army. Uh, yeah. Just joined the army a year before, and I remember yeah. it being so hot. But anyway, go on. I've disrupted you. This. No, it's okay. Uh, were you based in Liverpool or were you based in Germany? No, I was, was uh, in Red in Berkshire. Yeah. So it was even hotter down there, to be honest. Oh, yeah. it was red hot. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was the first year I went on a holiday. Well, sort of without my parents as well, in Spain, and coming home, it was hotter here than in Spain. In Mallorca, you know, in the height yeah. of summer, which is unheard of. I know, I could, re- well, I can remember how hot it was. Yeah, I was amazed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But going back to uh, what you asked, uh, the period and the locale, they're all real, but the characters, they're all fiction. When I say fiction, it's a mix and match jumble based on my imagination and friends and associates from the past. And the story is all fiction itself, but I've got three deep scars on the back of my head, which might tell a different story. Ah. <laughs> So it's a bit of a mix and match, really. Then, so you wouldn't be able to tell whether that's you or not in the in the book itself. It could be fictitious. It could be real. Mm. So yeah, that's the beauty about it. I suppose is that's that, that's a good way. I mean, to be fair, I've actually read this book, but it's been a few years ago now mm. when I read your original one. So I've probably m- forgotten a lot of the story. And to be honest, I can't remember what happens in North Wales. So I'm going to have to reread it. <laughs> So, obviously, you're not going to give anything away today, but it'll be nice to get a, a bit of a feel for it again. So, I mean, we, we touched on whether it's you or whether it's fiction or what. So, is it fiction? Is there elements of a, a memoir in there for you, or is it something else again? I think most writers will say, write what you know about. And they are sort of any characters or any fictitious characters. A lot of writers admit to basing it on real people. They won't actually say who they based it on. And they usually... Again, majority of them say it's based on a couple of people mixing personalities between them. Like the names, for instance, of the characters, I changed these about four times. I realised halfway through that everyone's name had a EY on the end. There was Davy, Tommy, Jimmy, Paulie, all, and they all sort of sounded sameish. So by the time I came to do the final edit, I renamed the characters. So again, they become sort of not real people in my head, but even more fictitious, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Did that come from you naming them all EYs? Was yeah. that because that's what you did in those in days? Liverpool, one of yeah, your mates was. called Davy Jimmy or, yeah. 
or Mikey or whatever. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember rightly. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah there's yeah. a lot of Yozzers as well. Anyone named Hughes was called Yozza. Yeah. They, well, that's it. That was that was par for the course, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. yeah. So when did um, if this was based <laughs> in seventy six? Yeah. When did you start writing this book? And in fact, when did you finish it? Now I think it took you a while, didn't it? It did. It's a, it's a whatever long story. Reason. Yeah, absolutely. I've dabbled in an ounce of fiction going back many years, going back to 1976. I started writing stories and sending them off to magazines and a couple of radio dramas I sent off to the BBC. Looking back now, they were awful. I'm not surprised <laughs> that they were rejected. But I think <laughs> I think unless you've got a great talent, um, I think it's, it's harder to write fiction, I think, unless you've lived a life, you've had experience. Like you, you can't really write about love and pain, maybe, until you know you've had a long-term relationship with your partner, or whether you've gone through serious illnesses, seeing your parents. I think your experience grows, and the, the writing it it becomes more richer in a way, more authentic. But when the actual writing down the story, um, the idea or the motivation came about eight, eight between eight and ten years ago when my daughter moved there and the family to New Zealand. Um, I knew we had a huge gap at weekends where we used to have the grandsons. So I started to write to fill in this gap, bullet points at first, and then fleshing the story out over a slow, uh, roughly about an 18-month period. So it's, it's sort of just, just just stated over a long time. Yeah, and you know what? I've got to agree with you. I mean, previous through previous experience with us interviewing authors and all that, we find that they definitely right from experiences yeah. they've had or it's happened to someone else. Mm. Uh, and it's proven as well from, you know, a lot of the people we've talked to, their most successful books are about, you know, things they know and, can yeah. you know, explain properly and in great detail. And that works for them. And as they all say, write about what you know, which yeah. is what you've said yourself. So yeah. that's a, that's, yeah, that's a brilliant way to look at it. So is this a one-off book? I mean, I know you've written it a while <laughs> ago, um, but was it considered to be a way where you consider it to be a one-off book at the time or was there going to be follows on or follow on books or is there now going to be like a trilogy or yeah the, the initial idea was that this is part one of a trilogy um i've stopped and started part two and part three many times over the years i've got them all down in bullet points um but for some reason it, it it's not working for me in my head the way this sort of the linear layout of the book one falls into place i'm struggling with it to be honest what i need is is a kick maybe some kind of an event in life to get made me sit down and get down to the business of finishing it off it's it's bloody hard work though you get to, i remember thinking when i was partly through writing tales of the green hills i'd written up something like thirty-five thousand words and i look back and go, wow look at how many i've done there and then i realized i wasn't even halfway through it is i think um, yeah. sarah moore had said to us it's like climbing a mountain you know, the top so far away. And as you get closer to it, you realise, you know, it's, it gets, it's getting even steeper near the top. And then once again... Yeah, once you, you find it more to go into it. Mm. Yeah, and then when, when you're right, the end, the end of it, that's not the end. In fact, that's just sort of uh, the beginning of the end. It's the edits and the rewrites. <laughs> and some people yeah, call the edits. The, and, yeah. It can go on forever. Some people call the initial draft, the vomit draft. Just get it all down on paper. Don't worry about it. Just just write and write and write. Finish it off, and then start the real work of tidying it up and edit it into a readable form. Yeah, how many times have we heard that too? Just throw it all on paper. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Yeah. Then afterwards, once you've got it down, that's when the hard work starts. You've got to sort it through. Yeah, as, as bad as that sounds, because it doesn't inspire you full of confidence <laughs> when you've got it all there, and then you've got to sit down for months and months. Yeah. And piece it all and put it in the right places and make sure you haven't killed Joe Bloggs off in chapter three and brought him back to life in exactly. chapter ten or whatever. Yeah, we've had a couple of ways of saying that. That yeah. happens, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um you you said book two and three are sort of in bullet points. Is yeah. book two not even did you not even start putting a few chapters together and no, I've actually not um, anywhere near at all? Yeah, in drips and drabs, there's a total of about forty thousand words um that are sort of well, waiting that's... there for me to go back to. Part way through, isn't it? So sometimes I, I, I'm thinking, hang on, I'm stuck here. There's a bit of a plot point here that I'm not. I, I you know, I, I don't believe it reads or th- it doesn't real true to me. 
And sometimes I get a bit of an inspiration. And think, ah, yeah, I know a fix for that. I'll start writing. But it's in dribs and drabs. I need to sit down and say to myself, like, some kind of real plan. You know, this weekend I will write 10,000 words and stick to it. But it, yeah, it's, so it's you've hard. Got to have, yeah, you've got to have some discipline about yeah. it, I suppose, yeah. haven't you? Say, I'm going to do 5,000 words Saturday or yeah. over the weekend or, yeah, yeah uh, you know, yeah, I suppose, you know, again, previous experience talking to authors, that's what they do, isn't it? I'm going yeah. to do this, that and the other, or I will sit aside and have a day where I'm going to do this and then maybe not touch you for a week or, yeah, I suppose you've got to have some sort of plan. And do you know where, have you got a rough idea where Tommy's going after, you know, after book one's finished? Have you got a rough idea? Is it all based back into North Wales or are it's, we going somewhere else? Or don't it, you know yet? Well, I was say. Uh, I don't want to say a spoiler for the end of the novel, the first one. Well, say don't, but, yeah, don't give us any spoilers, the, obviously. In part two, um, Tommy's living in a place very, very far away. And the settings there are sort of down under and Chicago and the States, Dublin and Ireland and back in Liverpool. So it sort of takes on a bit of a oh, universal right. so global thing. around the globe a bit. Oh, yeah. right. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And again, not trying to give away too much of the plot, I didn't think Tommy was that type of guy when, and re, from what I remember reading about him in the first book, he was more of a, a home bird, like yeah. a Liverpudlian scouser, yeah. you know, apart from, you know, the obvious going to rail on holiday type type thing is what all scousers did at the time, yeah. you know, and I'm sure that's what you did as well. Like, so yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, we'll see how you get on when you get round to book two and three, but at the moment it's about this book. And one of the reasons we're talking about it is because you've gone, with a traditional publisher, uh, Luna Eden, I think it is, isn't it? Now, yeah. explain the link here, because originally, uh, as you mentioned, you self-published with this yeah. book, but you've, you're coming on a relaunch. So explain about Luna Eden and how all that's happened and self-publishing and not self-publishing. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, as I said, when I, meant, when I finished the book, um, I did what most writers do. I sent emails, sent letters off to different traditional publishers. I must have since, I don't know, at least 30, I'd say, at the top of my head. And I could walk over the yeah. room with the rejections. Sometimes you wouldn't even get a reply. <laughs> at least you got some. I got some, yeah, I did get some replies saying, you know, it's, uh, you know, love the idea, love the plot, but not for us at the moment. Thanks, uh, you know, but carry on writing. And I got yeah, fed up with it. standard reject. Really, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. 99% of authors get these things and rejects. And I, I got to a point sort of two years after finishing the final edits where people were saying, you know, why don't you just self-publish it? And I think going back you know, five, six years ago, it was pretty new at the time with Amazon's um, uh, print on demand. That is, whereas a traditional publisher, they might have, you know, they might print off a thousand copies of a book, which may sit around in a warehouse gathering dust. But with Amazon, uh, some Amazon, a bot just presses a button and the book is published. And friends and family said to me, who were encouraging, said, um, instead of waiting, maybe never for a traditional publisher to pick it up, sort of let the public decide in a way, sell publisher, and then hopefully get some reviews to people to say, yeah, you know, it's not a, not a bad story there. And touch wood, I've had, you know, roughly about 80 five-star reviews for the novel. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, but roughly about six months ago on Twitter, a new publisher, Luna Eden, uh, they, they sent out a message saying, hi, you know, we're a new traditional publisher. We're looking for submissions. So I thought, uh, you know, not to lose, let's uh, let's reply. I sent a sample in and I was absolutely amazed. Almost, you know, a couple of days later, I got a reply saying, yeah, I like this. Sends the full manuscript in. And that was the first time anyone that's, had actually said that. So I thought, That's yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, let's wait for the... times change. Maybe that's, maybe that's what's good now. They want stuff like that now. I don't know. But... Uh, it yeah. was, um, as I said, I was, I was amazed. Um, the speed of it all, for one thing. Um, and the fact that I didn't get it wasn't rejected. Um, Patricia, the who set <laughs> up Luna Eden, uh, she's told me she's really enjoyed the story. Um, so I'm delighted to be. The, the story itself, the plot is the same. It's been sort of tidied up. It's been edited again very carefully. Um, some of the effing and jeffing language has been toned down. I think uh, for, right. maybe to appeal to a wider audience. I don't know. I'll see. Um, but yeah, I'm really that's... excited, and I just wish it had happened, you know, a bit more, a couple of years earlier. Yeah, yeah. 
I would have thought the with it being a, a scouser type book going into North Wales and all that, that you'd need that effing and jeffing to to get the point across about how the character is and who he is because he's a pure scouser yeah. and that's you know he's brought up in that type of stuff. But I suppose you know if it's to appeal to a varied audience, I suppose you've got to think about toning it down. Yeah, that's, yeah. I suppose I, that's I the think only way I can look. What, what I say it's toned down. I mean, it's um, you know, I wouldn't read, I wouldn't do a reading, you know, at the Vicar's Tea Party. You know, it's still there. The industrial <laughs> language is still there. But, um, <laughs> you know, I'll get a couple of smashed teacups. I think. At the, oh, excuse me, Vicar. Right, I, I get, I get the idea then. So it's still there. You still oh, know still this there, guy yeah. is a born and bred scout. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, just going back slightly, when you say print on demand, is that yeah. exactly what it is? If someone orders it, it gets printed. Is that exactly it? Exactly that. Yeah, it's not. Even, I don't think wow. you know a human even presses. I think if you order a book from Amazon, a bot you know will pick up that order. A button will be pressed somewhere, and a, a machine, a printer, will print the book off and get it out delivered to you maybe the next day. It's really good news that uh, Lunar Eden have picked it up and uh, you're going somewhere with this. At least you've yeah. got some support behind it. Yeah. Uh, so have you got a? Uh, well, you have got a book signing or a launch planned, is it, this weekend? It is this weekend, indeed, yeah. All As the... in this Saturday, this Saturday the... the 9th, I think it the... is. Yeah, 9th of November. Uh, the 9th of November, this Saturday, yeah, go on. Yeah. At two, between 2 and 4 p.m. in the Aldous Bookshop in the Blue Coat Chambers in Liverpool. Everyone's welcome. If you want to pop in and say hello and maybe uh, pick up a signed copy. I'm really Excellent. looking forward so to it. Still a bit nervous, but looking forward to yeah. it. So you're signing copies on the day and yeah. uh, willing to chat to people who come in and want to ask you about the book. Yeah. Uh, just going back to talking about the book again, some writers have told us that they lose themselves uh, with the characters and the characters come alive when they're working on a novel. Uh, and I've experienced this talking to other authors. They They say... A similar thing, but have you found this? Your, your characters run away with themselves and create their own uh, little bit of history and their own future, if you like, rather than the story that you've got brewing in your head. Do you find they just wander off on their own? I know that sounds a bit strange, but it's it's a good, exactly, exactly as, as you say, Steve. It's um, it's happened quite a few times writing the novel, and you know, it, it, it's sort of a weird feeling. And just going back a bit, I think, to why I haven't maybe completed part two and three, that hasn't happened yet with the writing from the, the second and third ah. part. I think that's because yeah. maybe I need I need an extended period nonstop to get into that groove of writing. But I remember that the first time it happened, one of the characters came into a scene far too early. I had bullet points with this Welsh character, Rhonda. She coming into a scene at the end of a chapter. I was typing away, lost in the groove. And here comes Rhonda. She sort of burst into the room at the beginning of the chapter. And I felt a bit, hang on, a bit sort of freaked out. Some like a ghostly apparition type of thing. Something had taken over the character with her coming alive. Yeah. But she was absolutely correct with the early entrance. It fitted perfectly with the scene. Much better than what I had planned in my bullet points. But I remember something like an hour or so later, walking around the garden, feeling a mild state of shock. But th that's like that's the magic of writing when you do <laughs> sort of get to that place where the characters say, nope, sod you, I'm alive, I'm you know, I'm going to move about and do and say what I want. It's right. schizophrenic, okay. maybe. <laughs> no, no, it makes sense. Is this, from memory, is this Rhonda that, did she just come into a pub or did she appear from somewhere? Is this the same one? or? She, yeah, she's in um, the episode. I remember the girl in the book. Yeah, she's the, the local farmer's daughter working in a, in a pub at the time. That's it. That's it. The Lindar Inn in Hanklin, North Wales. Ah, that's it. And you, something like that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that now. So yeah. that was your character that just decided to please herself yeah. on your in yeah. your in your head, basically. Yeah? yeah. I think actually I mentioned that some of the characters are a mix and mismatch. Rhonda was totally fictitious, and this may sound a bit weird, but she was more alive than the other characters who I was basing on. <laughs> you know, memories. This was just a Isn't whole new, new character. It was actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just a case. Ah, it's right. the first time now that actually. No, 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 I'm articulating that. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because, yeah, we all perceive things slightly differently. So I I, I perceive that Rhonda was a, a character that, or someone you, you probably knew. And uh, when you went, or potentially you went on holiday in, in yeah. 76, you know, but yeah. no, it's not. No, it's, not yeah. at all. No, no, no. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, that's the beauty about it. You would never know what part of. 
a fictitious and what part of what happened to you or or other people experience because that's what it's all about. Yeah, good I just, stuff. I just need to do a disclaimer as well. I've got legal advice from a lawyer to say that if anyone called Rhonda from the area uh, tries to Ooh. take any action against me, it's you know purely fictitious, honestly. <laughs> Never even thought about that, but the chances <laughs> are of a Rhonda in the area is quite big. But in that cup being a BR maid and being a yeah. farmer's daughter, whatever, it's probably yeah. unlikely. Yeah, but no. okay. Um, I probably, probably. Uh, wraps it up about how your book's going to go and you've got the book signing this Saturday but um, final question really from me then what advice would you share or give to a, a, a writer or someone who's going to write a book for the first time uh, and I think we've probably covered some of it but yeah. in your experience someone comes to you and says I'm going to write a book Terry what do we do I, I think um, you nailed it on the head I think earlier Stephen you said discipline that's what a lot of people say to me uh, when you mention that you've got a book out there they've got a great idea in the head but I always say you, you can't tap an idea on a desk you need to get the words down on paper and you can tap the desk with your paper that you've written on but even if you're writing just for just maybe 15 minutes per day you're writing 100 words a day it does build up and you gradually you do get there to, to be able to type the end and I'd say as well uh, for people who sort of were thinking of it, who started and stopped, much like myself with part two and three. Never give yeah. up on your dream, seeing your work published. Keep at it. J.K. Rowling, she was rejected multiple times before Harry Potter became an overnight sensation. But it's that word Absolutely, again, Steve. Yeah, yeah it's the discipline. Yeah. And it's the enjoyment you can get from it. I mentioned the magic of writing. And that, that's a unique feeling that as well, I think. If you can sort of get into that groove of writing down your own story, and the magic happens when the characters come alive. You know that if it's magic for you, that magic is going to rub off a reader, will sort of feel that magic and sense it. Yeah, and... yeah. I suppose it happens to the best of us, though, don't it? You know, we all have that, we've all heard of it, writer's block when people yeah. sit down and it just goes blank. Yeah. And I know you're not, not at that point, but you're at a point where you've got your subjects there but yeah. you don't know which direction to take them in. And it just takes, it'll just take that ding moment yeah. in yeah. your in your head to yeah. uh, to happen. And I think you'll be able to just let it flow then and go, but you just need that that inspirational moment, don't you, I suppose, yeah. really? Yeah. A, a yeah. lot of people say that uh, to get over the writer's book. If you can, when you sort of, you, your time's up and you're writing for the day, stop in mid-sentence. So at least the next day, you know, it's an easy sort of injunction, you know, to come back to your writing. Just to finish Easy that start, sentence off. Yeah. Easy start, yeah. You're starting, you know, you're walking downhill from there. Yeah, you finish your sentence and then naturally that will lead your brain into thinking of the next one yeah. rather than you going in there and you've got full stop. Now, yeah. what am I going next? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I never thought of that before. Mm. No. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, it's been great talking to you about your book, Safety. Good luck on Safety at the launch and I'll certainly be there at two o'clock. At the latest, uh, and spend an hour with you and see how we get on. Brilliant. See if you can sell more than, more than one book. <laughs> see if you can get more than one time. <laughs> so, so <fun>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's been brilliant, though, Steve. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday. And uh, thanks very much. Yeah, brilliant, as usual. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah, because the only time we do see each other or quite often is on a Zoom call like this. Yeah, or passing books on. Yeah. yeah. Or passing books on, yeah. In fact, speaking of which. I'll speak to you about uh, passing books on again in a minute. But, uh, okay. Yeah, right. thanks, and uh, good to speak to you, and good luck on Saturday. All cheers. right, cheers, Steve. Thanks for now. Thanks. Cheers.